Hi everyone, I am coming to you from Davos and I am sitting here with Secretary General of the Digital Cooperation Organization. I'm joined by Her Excellency Dima Al Yahya and we are going to have a conversation about something that I think is really being left out of a lot of conversations here across Davos at the moment when we're talking about AI, digital cooperation, digital inclusion is what we're really trying to get at here in this conversation. So for those who don't know the DCO, can you just tell us a little bit more about what your organization does and the work that you focus on, please? Oh, definitely. Uh, DCO, Digital Cooperation Organization, is an intergovernmental organization that focuses on creating a more uh, sustainable, resilient uh, digital economy uh, for all our members states and also open opportunities for uh, uh, women, youth and entrepreneurs to prosper in the digital economy. We truly believe that digital economy is the economy for, uh, that's going to flourish, uh, not in the future but of now. We, we predict in our um, uh, trends report uh, 2025 that uh, uh, tw 24 trillion dollars is going to be added to the GD uh, total global GDP. Uh, which is 21% uh, from the overall global GDP and triple the uh, traditional uh, economy. So that by itself showcases that how this economy is flourishing and mm -hmm. how it creates great opportunities for governments and also for private sector for them to grow uh, um, uh, going forward. Uh, the essence of what we do is for member states to start sharing best practices together. Um, and why should we reinvent the wheel? If something is working in one country, let's share it with the others. And, and by that, we uh, expect that acceleration in nice. digital economy and the growth of digital uh, uh, and digital transformation. Uh, this is the essence of what DCO does. Fantastic. Now break that down a little bit further for me. I mean you're seeing these trends. Um, what types of digital innovations and what types of digital trends are you seeing across different contexts? Does it vary depending on country to country? What are you seeing on the ground? Well I, um, I do see it varies because every country has its unique uh, competitive advantage. Uh, uh, and uh, some countries have very uh, uh, powerful, robust infrastructures. Other countries have amazing, youthful brain power, uh, and others have great capital when it comes to funding these innovations. What we're trying to do is bridge that gap between these countries mm -hmm. and open the market. We represent by now uh, 16 countries, 800 million in population. That by itself is a huge, compu uh, uh, not c just computing, but customer market for any startup or any enterprise. So what we're trying to do is opening that market for companies to start cross-border very easily, making technology available, and also creating more options for the countries and making sure that these companies are growing. Because if they grow, they're feeding their economies uh, as well. Um, Therefore, we go and look at what is the differences between these countries and we link the, docs, uh, the dots between the supply and the demand uh, uh, and therefore we help bridge that communication gap mm -hmm. between the private sector and between the governments. Great. So there's the communication gap, but there's also just the digital access gap, right? Oh, definitely. We'd love to talk about that with you. Kind of what are you seeing? Definitely, and especially here in WEF when we're talking about AI, its progression, the capabilities and the opportunities that come with AI is massive, either from um, uh, increasing the quality of life or even ease of doing business, more efficiency, and increase in performance and, and governments. Uh, we're looking at using a technology that would consume a lot of energy. Mm. So if we have an AI produced image that consumes more energy than charging your smartphone, so energy is going to be a very big challenge in the future to use the benefits or to harness these benefits of AI. So if it's going to be a huge challenge in developed countries, what do you, we expect that is going to affect triple in developing countries if they don't even have reliable uh, electricity. Right. Um, so that's a challenge. And then you have another challenge which, which comes into computing power. 
computing power needs a lot of investment and a lot of, uh, of capital, especially that the supply is less than the demand on a global level. And here is where you're going to have huge uh, nations, especially the uh, emerging markets or let's say the developing uh, economies, left behind. In a time where we had digital divide a challenge, digital divide itself, we still have 2.7 billion people still not connected. Like they're enough. off grid. Yeah. So if they're not even connected, how are they going to, and we're talking about an intelligent age. <laughs> so we're increasing that divide more. We're not solving this divide, but we're increasing that divide by introducing AI in a way that we're not trying to uh, level the playing field or at least consider that, that, uh, uh, that there is going to be a gap. We're looking at numbers, beautiful numbers that we hear. Um, Three billion uh, uh, dollars of investment, for instance, in computing power investment in the Middle East. Uh, we're looking at trillions of dollars being put into uh, uh, infrastructure for uh, AI. Uh, but I would say, where is that capital going? It's in a very, um, a very limited number of countries that you can count in, in uh, uh, with your uh, um, uh, with your um, uh, uh, with your hands. So um, this is where our concern is, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that at least we provide the right uh, uh, re resilient, sustainable infrastructure for our member states, enable them with the education and the talents and, and the, um, uh, the upskilling uh, of talents that they need to create their own local content and start innovating uh, and creating their own uh, uh, AI applications. Right. You know, you're so right. I feel almost here at Davos a little bit of whiplash, right? I was As I was walking to meet you, Secretary General, I passed by on the promenade a dog that was a robot, but his hands were up like this, like a regular dog, and he was walking around, he had a little yeah. tail. And then I'm kind of going back and thinking about the things that we cover at DevEx and the things that you're focused on, which is, which is this equity divide. Yeah. Um, so kind of all of that to be said, I would love to know a little bit more if you could perhaps give me an example of the way in which this works um, on a particular country, perhaps one member state or one business partnership. Oh, definitely. You know, as I, 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 can, I can sum it up in three main things. But first, uh, as I've mentioned uh, uh, earlier, is that we're looking at where is the competitive advantage in one country. And here is where we have created the Gen AI Center of Excellence, mm -hmm. where we are decentralizing that capacity. So for instance, we look at where are the countries that are actually investing in computing power. So we do see countries like Saudi Arabia, like Kuwait, like uh, 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 other from our member countries. And we see what other countries that can benefit from that computing power. And we're, we're creating these new models of innovation mm -hmm. that can help and support that uh, uh, these expertise to come in and utilize these computing power from other member countries. Huh. Second is that we're looking at uh, more the uh, 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 what regulations and policies that will enable more that sharing of IP and that sharing of uh, applications when it comes to AI uh, development and that's from an application layer. Mm. And then we're looking at more AI governance. How can we unify more standards and principles that will enable member states to uh, uh, innovate very quickly? Last but not least, we do have a, um, we launched a navigator, which is a digital economy navigator. And that gives the our member states a portfolio of where are the gaps to be mature in digital economy and in AI. Mm. And we don't leave them there. Mm. We come in with the uh, opportunities or the solutions to bridge that gap from other member states. Mm. And we connect them with the private sector as well as the financial institutions that can fund these initiatives. So we come with a full uh, value chain of, uh, uh, of, a, uh, of a service for our member states. Right. So what do you think are the biggest challenges in that work? I mean, what are the biggest barriers toward achieving these linkages between countries and between digital capacities, perhaps, in one part of the world and, and to another? Well, I think the, the biggest challenge would be uh, uh, the right investment in capital. 
directing them to the right opportunities. Second is the availability of data. So if we would look at the first one, which is investment in capital, is there? Yes, there is capital, mm -hmm. but it is, is it directed the right way? And here is where investors as well as uh, governments and also uh, uh, looking at VCs and venture capitals and, and angels um, or even financial institutions uh, and development funds, uh, they need to know exactly where, where should they deploy that money. And this is where second, the data comes in. The data is not available of what is the need. Mm. And this is where uh, 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 we, in the, in the DEN, we uh, uh, provide that data to the private sector and financial mm -hmm. institutions. And we, we say, okay, these are the opportunities in Pakistan. These are the opportunities in Morocco. These are the opportunities in Oman. And this is the competitive advantage. And mm -hmm. that helps them in taking these investment decisions, mm -hmm. as well as the financial, the development uh, uh, um, uh, funds as well. It's new to them to start investing in digital infrastructure and deploying that uh, development fund in digital infrastructure. Here is where we come in with the data to help them and support them uh, in, in directing that, uh, that funding. So I think these are the, the main challenges that we see. Uh, the third challenge is the supply. The supply is less than the demand mm -hmm. and uh, 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 this where cooperation and working with each other with the governments with the private sector is essential mm -hmm. uh, uh, to bridge that uh, supply uh, demand. I remember hearing a statistic recently that there are more data centers in the state of Virginia than there are across the entire continent of Africa. Oh, wow. I mean this is a big task that the DCO has, has tried to navigate and to try to fill those gaps. I mean. I'm curious, when you're having these conversations at Davos, is this something that you feel the private sector does want to fill? Because ideally, these would be customers, right? These would be folks using these services. I guess it depends on how it's marketed, et cetera. Um, but what type of traction are you getting this week? Oh, definitely. I think it's uh, uh, the intentions are always positive. The intentions are always to bridge the gap. It's about the how. And this is where... Uh, uh, um, uh, Platforms like uh, uh, WEF and, and other platforms and DCO help in bridging that communication gap. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, the private sector need to know. They, they need the data to know exactly where should they invest and, and where should they uh, double down in terms of their innovations as well and, and how can they progress and enhance their innovations. Government, on the other hand, they have to know what innovations are there. Mm -hmm and that would help them in terms of their digital transformation. Um, so I think the, the dialogue is always positive. Uh, it's just the how and providing the right data that can bridge that gap, which is connecting the dots uh, uh, that would ease uh, a win-win uh, situation always. Yeah. If I can turn the attention toward you for a moment, I mean, why is this, you've worked in this field for years, why is this such a important topic to you? Kind of what's, what do you feel is at stake if we don't get this right? Oh, well, uh, uh, that's, uh, uh, I'm, uh, that's I'm very passionate about, <laughs> about my, my sector specifically. Uh, I've been a geek since I was 12. We love that. Uh, so <laughs> for me, it's, um, uh, I'm living uh, the best time right now where, um, uh, the sector that I'm very passionate uh, uh, about and, and the profession that I have chosen is now in the forefront of uh, the strategies, the directions of each and every prime minister and president of every country, um, uh, which gives us a huge responsibility mm -hmm. as well uh, in finding solutions because technology and enabling and empowering uh, uh, technology uh, can really do miracles to the advancement of uh, humankind. Mm. Uh, let's uh, look at jobs, for instance. Just bringing in AI and robotics uh, to um, uh, to uh, I forgot the word, but um, uh, to replace yes, to replace blue collar jobs mm. that will uplift uh, uh, the humankind to get more more white co white collar jobs, mm. and this is what we need. We need to upskill people to get the white collar jobs. Mm. Uh, so these are all potential that uh, uh, technology provides. Healthcare, for instance, uh, telecom. Uh, te uh, sorry, um, uh, telemedicine, for instance. Now we see virtual 
virtual hospitals happening. Mm-hmm. Like uh, in Saudi Arabia, there's a virtual hospital that actually performs uh, uh, checks, uh, medical checks in Africa and Asia and, and other countries. Uh, we just celebrated a surgery, a heart transplant uh, by robots. Oh my goodness. Which reduced the time of the surgery and also reduced the complexity and made it, uh, the pr- it's very, pr- the provision and, and also the accuracy uh, increased a double. Mm. So that by itself is huge for us as humankind. Mm. Uh, what I think going forward is that we really need to put, it really need to think of our strategies uh, as a human-centric approach. Mm. And in every investments or in every gro- uh, growth that we're looking in digital, uh, humans have to be in the center of what we're doing. Right, because I think that human-centric approach, if you forget that, I mean, it's kind of the, my first thought when you were just describing, yeah. okay, if we get rid of this blue-collar sector, I mean, those are people's jobs, yes, right? So, yes. so how do we, I mean, that's there's a risk yes. there, right? And there's a risk that that will strip livelihoods. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, how do you balance those two things, right? It's like, where, where does AI and where does technology and, mm-hmm. and you know, digital innovation fit in a way that is not harming humankind? Oh, it's yes. a very big uh, question. <laughs> it is. It is a big question. But in terms of jobs specifically, mm. this is an opportunity for uh, up, uh, for us to increase the quality of jobs. Mm. Uh, at the end of the day, the, the blue collar jobs, in my personal perspective, uh, uh, is not made for humankind. Mm. We, we have uh, the p- complexity of our brains and the smartness that we have. We need to use them in more blue, white collar jobs. Mm. And this is where we have an opportunity uh, uh, to, to create these new kinds of jobs. But the thing is, is as you have mentioned, w- uh, we have to balance. And this is where we have to work from now on upskilling and providing the educational programs uh, uh, to all kinds of, uh, uh, um, all levels and all kinds of our uh, communities, um, uh, either professions or t- technology professionals, or either um, uh, a doctor, a teacher, uh, uh, a farmer, uh, to know how to use technology and to know how to benefit. They, they benefit themselves when using technology. Last but not least, we really need to um, embed the thought of being a job creator and not job seeker. Hmm. And I think that's what technology brings to the table. Just by being uh, exposed to the power of AI and a power of technology, that enables individuals to create their own jobs. Uh, like for instance, uh, we have a, an initiative called uh, We Elevate, mm-hmm. and we, it is moving women traditional businesses into online businesses. By empowering these women with training programs on financial acumen, uh, uh, um, uh, marketing, and so on, providing them with applications like uh, uh, payment gateways mm-hmm. and supply chain management and delivery management using AI and empowered with AI, enabled those women to expand their their markets to reach to bigger markets as well increase their revenue and recruit and create more jobs for others Uh, so that by itself is is power and at the end of the day they are not the IT professionals you know they are the business (laughs) women fantastic well thank you so much for joining us today secretary general before I let you go is there anything else that you would like to add anything else that's top of mind for you this week um, or anything else you'd like to leave our well audience thank with? you so much for for having me uh, I would say the the most important message uh, uh, on a global level is that let's not uh, uh, forget the gap let's not increase that gap and it w- uh, and that will happen if we focus on a human centric approach and we have the mentality when it comes to creating an inclusive, sustainable, and resilient infrastructure on a global level. Mm. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.